Yo, 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 what's going on, guys? It's KP, Professional Valorant IGL. You're watching Pedro Romero's interviews. I hope you guys enjoy. Stay tuned. Hey, guys, this is Pedro back with another interview. Again, covering Game Changers. I'm here with Rib. She is uh, one of the many people taking part in the Game Changers scene as a competitor. And I have here with me today just to cover her new team in addition to her teammates, which of which includes KP, a person that I just talked to in another, in another one of my videos. So... Um, Rib, thank you so much for taking the time and just having this conversation with me. I really do appreciate it. And you know, I already asked you a little bit before the start of this recording, but just more so, um, how are you doing at this moment? I mean, how how are the vibes? How are how is your life uh, so <laughs> far? You know, before the the start of, of your new team. Uh yeah, vibes are good. Feeling really great. Um, a lot of change recently moving over from Australia to uh, Canada. Um, it's been a big change, but it's been very exciting. And yeah, Valorant Wise, very excited about the new team. And yeah, I'd love to tell you more. Yeah, um, first covering, you know, moving over to North America. It was an announcement you put in a few weeks ago, I believe, a few a few months ago. You can correct me mm -hmm. if wrong if I'm you can correct me if I, if I'm wrong there, but yeah, how has the transition been like for you to just living in a new country, um, leaving home, you know, just having to make that whole major switch, um, in your life? Uh, yeah, it's definitely something very exciting that I've wanted to do for a pretty long time, moving overseas, and yeah, it was a little bit intimidating because this is my first time living out of home and paying rent and. You know, things like credit scores aren't a thing in Australia, so that was a bit of a challenge finding rental here, but it's all been really exciting and I've really loved the change, I've loved the cold, Canada's a great place. Um, yeah, it's been really great. You know, most of the time people move into another country and they do so with another person, you know, that way the mm. transition would be um, not as difficult. So are you living by yourself, you know, currently? Uh, no, my boyfriend and I, we moved together, uh, and so he's been he's been great, really great support, uh, um, and it's been huge help. Okay, I, I see, I understand, I understand. And hmm. yeah, um, getting into not just more so deciding to move to a different country, but also doing so for the sake of your career, trying to grow individually-wise and just try to find more success in a region such as North America. Um, what kind of led you to this, to this to the decision of just... Um, switching over from like competing in APAC slash O's and then going over here to, to North America? Um, so I've definitely watched the North American scene from afar for a pretty long time. Um, I was always very jealous of the teams and the competition and just the amount of support the region gets overall compared to OCE. Um, but as for making the plunge, I was very inspired by Bibian. She was my old CS teammate and you probably might know She's found really great success with FlyQuest Red and previously CLG. Um, so yeah, I was amazed watching what she was doing. And when she moved, I think a year, two years ago. Um, and then on top of that, I spoke to Bob a lot. Um, and yeah, she was a great help. She really encouraged me and gave me a lot of help with some of the visa stuff. And yeah, really grateful to Bob for those conversations. And yeah, it was a big help in pushing me to you know, finally make the change. Yeah, uh, Bibian, a, a very well-regarded person within the Impact scene right now. One, one that I actually talked to when I was in, in DreamHack Dallas last year. And yeah, uh, uh, quite a, a, a good cast of people coming from Australia and the entire Oceanic region. And yeah, um, now getting into your new team, of course. Um, <clears throat> so... Um, I already talked a little bit of, of KP about it, but I want to know, but I want to ask, you know, for you again, from your perspective and um, about this new team, you know, um, who's going to be part of your new team? What's the team going to be about and what kind of role are you going to be specifically within that lineup? That way everybody can get an idea as to what this new team exactly is. Yeah, so for the team, we've got KP, of course. She's our IGL and she's playing mostly our info initiator, sometimes flexing. Um, and then we've got Millie, our duelist. And yeah, she's been great. Very sharp, very vocal, fantastic player. And Presley, Smokes player, again, vocal player, very sharp, 
Um, there'll be a bit of a trend of that in this team, and our final pickup mo most recently was Kazla, and again, amazing, amazing player. Um, Kazla IGL'd for YFP, so having someone with that experience has been great because a lot. Of, and Kazla is on Flash Initiator most of the time, um, and having someone who is a bit more of a leader, a bit more experienced in making mid round calls has been great on that role because she's able to kind of direct like the pack if KP isn't necessarily with that group um, and take a bit more initiative initiative in that role. Um, so yeah, very excited. And yeah, I'll be on Sentinel in the team, um, which is a role that I've probably played the most. Most of my teams have been on Sentinel. So I'm very comfortable slotting into that. And yeah, I'm really, really excited with this group. It's a great call. What have you been fitting in with this new team? Because um, as of the time of the recording, I asked KP about you know how many kind of reps you guys have had, and you guys have just literally starting out around roughly one week in. Um, how, how has the dynamic been for you? How have you been fitting in with this with this um, cast of of players in relation to how you you've been fitting with all of your past teams? You know, be it in North America and also in in O's. Um, yeah, so we do kind of lack reps with this team because, like you said, it's maybe a week, a couple weeks old. Um, but I do think that a lot of the players have a lot of the foundational knowledge. And so we're a lot of the time on the same page with um, how we want to play, how we think we should be reacting in the mid-round. Um, and that helps a lot because you don't need to necessarily spend the time explaining like, oh, you know, I think we should react this way when this happens. And it just means that we're quicker to get on the same page, even although we don't have that experience. Um, and it, it's not always the case. There will be times that we're needing to discuss um, different like philosophies and approaches to the game. But for the most part, I think because we have a lot of experienced players on the team that we kind of are able to take some shortcuts and get on the same page a bit quicker. I do understand that um, it, it's a mixture of like new slash old talent and people experienced veterans, you know, including yourself, you know, given the fact that you've been able to compete for a few years, you know, outside of Valorant and into CS. And um, that said, you know, how would you compare this team? Although I do say this with the fact that, you know, we're kind of literally not even a month slash two weeks in. But yep. uh, how would you compare this with, like, your past teams? or And also, what, what kind of, um, what do you feel has been the biggest difficulty so far, you know, it, it, at this, this moment in time? Although, yes, I do say that with the, with the um, understanding that, you know, it's still a new team. Um. Yeah, I guess compared to other teams, oh, I'm not too sure how it measures up. I think it's probably too early to say. Um, I think we've definitely hit the ground running a bit faster than some of my teams previously, and I think that we have similar approaches to how we want to practice, which I think is really great. So um, I'm very happy to do like VOD reviews outside of practice, whereas a lot of teams, it's very, it's always intended to be done like we'll say like oh we'll vod review at the end of the week and then the end of the week comes and you know maybe something comes up life happens um but this team has been a bit quicker to kind of implement what we say we want to do um which i think is going to be really great for our improvement in the long run um and i think also difficulties we've had uh might need to think a bit more but uh it's been it's been pretty smooth sailing like i don't want to um i don't know be too like rose tinted glasses and assume that everything's going great like we have had i guess like low energy nights where we've kind of gone on autopilot and our coach has been really great at reining that in and kind of calling a timeout letting us know like hey we're not really practicing intentionally right now like we need to dial in we need to focus um, and we've kind of bounced back really quickly from that, which is another thing that I don't think we've necessarily had called out in previous teams of mine. Um, and I think it really helped us get back on track faster as opposed to just letting things slide. 
you know, you mentioned coach. Uh, um, who's the coach? You know, if you uh, share, remote. We've got remote coaching us at the moment, and he's okay. been fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And yeah, it, it, it's an interesting team to look at when it comes to looking at this squad. Um, given the fact that you guys have KP, and also you mentioned Kassler, um, mm. their IGLing in the past. How have you viewed KP's IGLing? Because you know she is. Uh, a member of that 2022 Shopify world runners up uh, team and you know, taking that team to that high ceiling. And how have you viewed their IG on, you know, in particular, you know, what kind of um, biggest observations that you made from that front? Yeah, well, I can definitely see how she's reached those heights before. I think she's great. She's definitely a seasoned like veteran in the scene. Um, she's got the experience and I think something that sets her apart specifically is that she's very naturally a leader for the team um, because myself I've IGL'd but I've never been able to step into that role of leadership where you know I'm not just calling shots and calling strategies because I've got like the analytical mind for it but I don't have like the same sort of charisma that KP brings and I think that's been really great and something that I'm really enjoying working with her is that um, she gets everyone on board with ideas. She keeps the energy high, and yeah, it's been really, really good working with her. What about remote? Because uh, they've been also been pretty experienced in the game changer scene. And how have you viewed their their, their coaching? How does that then um, uh, play into you know KP's ideeing and also probably mid round and calling featuring Kaz and maybe also yourself as well. So uh, how does that kind of dynamic um, intermix with, with each other, you know, remote coaching and also um, the IGL and calling and stuff like that? Um, I think it complements really well because I see remote strengths. He's very analytical and very organized. And I feel like he has watched a lot of Valorant. Like he watches every region you can think of and... You know, he's not locked into one specific way of playing. He's very flexible. Um, and he's been great in kind of just helping us analyze things that are going wrong. And he'll let us know, like, things we need to work on next. And it just kind of it alleviates some of the pressure off KP um, to be providing that feedback because he's got it all written down. He can let us know, like, what we need to work on next. And KP can focus on her IGLing, her own gameplay. Um, and yeah, I think it's been working really well with this core. You, you said that the team, or more, more so the head coach, observes other teams in different regions. Exactly what? Which teams are out of curiosity? Ah, uh, I don't know if I want to give too much away, but um, <laughs> uh, he's watched a lot of APAC, which I'm very happy with. I love APAC, um, naturally. And, you know, China and E. I think you name it, he's probably watched some of it, but I think it's probably more rare for NA teams to look outside of NA and EU, um, which it's not a bad thing, but it is always um, more interesting looking outside of that and getting a bit more creative freedoms with the team comps and the style of play. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that as well. Yeah, and you know, for, from that point on, when you then decided to compete in North America, you, you've been taking part in quite a few different um, events. Of course, I can say, you know, qualifiers and also a Cozy Clash, FlyQuest, Trailblazer, and a little bit of, of more recently um, Radiant Academy. And I'm kind of curious on how you view your experience in North America so far, you know, competitive-wise compared to I was in Oceania, even including your current team, you know, how have you viewed your kind of progression playing for teams such as, you know, Unpaid Dogs and trying to buy for a spot in the main event? So bringing, up, bring, bringing it all back, how have you kind of viewed your, your individual progression in North America, just competing there, trying to fight with the rest of the teams there? Yeah, it's definitely been very interesting. And I think the biggest takeaway that I had when I first moved here is just the amount of competition that's available. Um, so for reference, in OCE, we'd maybe get a couple of tournaments a year, if that, and if you don't qualify for that, then 
you're kind of not set up to play in the main league and you aren't really getting too much official experience. Um, whereas since I moved here, you know, I've had Cozy Clash, I've had Radiant Academy game changes, there's been Sakura Cups, there's been, um, you know, mixed Knights tournaments that are available to play and all the co-ed events. And, you know, it's just, you can develop a lot quicker when you have that sort of experience and you can get those reps in, not just in practice and in scrims, um, but in tournaments, because tournament experience is very different to how you should be playing in scrims. Um, and it's also been really great to see kind of where I measure up in North America as well. Um, that's kind of where I was most excited to see. Um, you know, I can watch the VODs, but until you're playing it, you don't really know what it's going to feel like, what the level of play is like. Um, and because I think in OCE, in the Game Changers scene, I felt that it's a very small scene, and I felt that to continue improving, I had to keep playing co-ed, um, continue on to co-ed in OCE. Um, whereas here, I feel like I can definitely develop within the Game Changers scene here just because it is much larger and there are a lot more players. Um, so I've still got a lot to learn here. You know, I'm sure you had your options available, just not just going to North America and then maybe going over to APEC due to the proximity, you know, to that that country, maybe even EMEA, but, you know, kind of far away, isn't it? <laughs> But uh, yeah, uh, but then again, to go to North America, which is already one of the most competitive regions in the world, you know, having Shopify and then FlyQuest um, and then a little bit of, of other teams also decimate, which we finished, I think, third place and Passion Project, which consists of uh, teams that were uh, players that are already were formerly a part uh, of an organization, you know, it, it does kind of make it quite a massive challenge for you to just go to North America. So why do you feel, you know, you wanted to take that challenge in particular? You know, why why go to, to North America compared to other regions? Um, I think a lot of it was just from the outside looking in, there was a lot of competition, like I mentioned before, and a lot more opportunity. And I figured there wouldn't be any language barriers for me because um, I only speak English and um, I'm not too confident in my ability to pick up a new language depending on where I moved. Um, and so it seemed like probably the best fit for me personally. And like I mentioned before, I guess I'd seen Bob move over and Bibby move over and, you know, they kind of inspired me like, oh, like they're doing fantastic things over here. Like I'm going to give it a shot. Like it was slightly different. They got sponsored to move. I've just moved for fun um but yeah i think it's been great so far and i don't regret the choice it's the start of a process and you know uh, it, who might who might adjust somebody uh end their process at the start at, at when they're literally at the start of it so you know, it, it's just a wait hmm. and see kind of thing and yeah hopefully you know this, this kind of thing then breeds better things uh both you know uh within and outside of the server for you Riv, and now I want to take it uh, 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 to a different direction for this com conversation. W one of the, the biggest reasons why I wanted to talk to you when the opportunity presented itself is just the fact that, you know, you've been, like I said, an experienced player taking part in various competitions, not just in Valorant, but also in CS. So I want to then get into CS and yep. start off there and you know, you, for you to, to, to compete in um, the women's scene, which was back then, you know, before impact and for those of you who aren't familiar with impact impact is basically the same thing as game changers but more so in, in, in counter-strike and but still like we're, we're, we're focusing on to before impact and uh, and i can assume of course you know as someone that wasn't present covering the scene um at that time that it probably must have been a difficult time for any um woman player to 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 kind of formulate a career and, and stuff like that but still um talk to me about just to start off your start in counter-strike you know you taking part you deciding to pursue a career in the game in the women's scene and also maybe also in the co-ed scene so um 
why did you even take part in competing in the first place? Um, I guess my very first start, I was playing in a CSGO 1v1 server. And a girl reached out to me and she said, oh, like, I think you're pretty good. Have you considered competing? And, you know, I did want to compete, but I just didn't really know how to start, where to get that in. Um, and she put me in contact with a few players that were looking for players in Australia. Um, one of them was Artemis, who went on to be my IGL for my first team. Um, and this was when I was 16, so I was in my final year of high school. And yeah, like I trialed with them and I managed to get picked up. And we played our first competition. We qualified for the LAN in Sydney. And then that became my first LAN tournament that I played in. We won that, which was amazing. I was with a great team. It wasn't me, but they were great. <laughs> um, and yeah, it just kind of started from there. And I really fell in love with competing. I loved the tournaments. Attending LAN was an amazing experience for me. Um, and yeah, that's how I, how I started in Counter-Strike. So just to get an idea as to like exactly which year, you know, what, how long ago was it? You know, when you first decided to take part in those first lands. Uh, this was 2018. 2018. Okay, so yeah. roughly around six years ago. Six years ago. I, I, I'm kind yeah, of thinking. Yeah. I'm kind of thinking that we're like in 2023, so I was going to say four years ago, but uh, <laughs> I mean, it just goes to show how fast um time just time passes. Flies. And, yeah. And, and yeah. Um, on top of that, yeah, you were also a part in an event in Katowice back in 2019. Yes. You can correct me there if I'm wrong there. Yep, no, that's right. Okay, perfect. And then you were also, although, yes, you know, the team finished seventh and eighth, uh, <laughs> basically in the last uh, places of that event, it must have been also been such a, an eye opening experience just to take it a step further from that kind of experience in Sydney, taking part in your first land. So, um, well, more so, talk to me about that kind of experience and talk to me about the rest of your teammates because, you know, you mentioned a little bit about Artemis, but I want to know exactly uh, who, who your other teammates was and just get get a, a, an idea of the state of, of women's CS in, in, in your home country. So at the time of Katowice, we had... Um... Artemis, our IGL, I think we had just picked up Bibian. Um, she was a really young player at the time. I think she's a year younger than I am, so she was 16 when we went over to Poland. Um, we had Connie, who was very experienced. Um, she'd been on that team a lot longer than I had as well. Um, very seasoned player. She was great. And also Hope, um, who's, again, a little bit older than me, but not quite as um, experienced as Artemis and Connie were. Yeah, and what was that kind of experience like, you know, playing with that team, just trying to understand what a team is, just trying to fit in mm -hmm. with, like, um, an IGO, having to play under an IGO, having to understand, you know, timing, strats, you know, stop taking on better competition, more so compared to, like, the usual rank play, or usual face it games and stuff like that. Uh, how much of a, of a difference was that? is trying to transition into just being an actual player in the first place. Yeah, so it was a very big transition for me because, um, you know, it was my first team experience. There was a lot of just concepts and, like, fundamental Counter-Strike knowledge that I was missing. Um, and, like, thankfully, Artemis and Connie, they were both more experienced than I was and they had had more team experience. Um, they kind of spent that time to try to explain it to us and I think a lot of the time I would be on the same site as Connie and she would kind of try to take on a bit more leadership and kind of help me tell me what to do a lot of the time um, which I think was necessary I was very young I didn't really have an understanding um, of the game very well at that point but I think it did help me a lot to try and learn fast under those two yeah and what about Bibian? Because I mean, at that point, yes, Bibian was like barely new, but it, it eventually became apparent that she was going to 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 be like one of the biggest stars of Oceanic um, Women's CS, and just then having to move to North America, playing for CLG Red, then FlyQuest Red. 
uh talk to me about, about baby on her what, what was she like you know back then in, in the early days and also did you kind of get an idea as to like the player she would become you know later on down the line yeah i think so because because she was such a young player um and she was so sharp like players like that they seem to have just uncapped potential um it's really just about the work that they put in so at the time she was very much like i was all aim no brain um very sharp very young very nervous as well um so she would be feel a lot of pressure especially those first few events but you know she's obviously she put in so much work and it was incredible like especially the years after i transitioned to valorant um i think she really came into her own and she put in a lot of hours and um, she's always been someone who was very coachable as well. She would try and take as much help and I think that really shows in just how quickly she improved and how great of a CS player she's become. Um, so yeah, I think, and she's just always had a great attitude as well. Like I've got nothing but great things to say about Viv. Like I loved playing with her and I love seeing her succeed now. Yeah, and it's a quite an experience for you to just look at a player and then see them grow. But also for you, of course, you know, having that experience and then going over to a different game eventually. And yeah, uh, talking about just sort of your team, uh, according, like looking at, at your profiles, you're looking at, you know, what there is to see uh, um, statistic wise for your career. Is it, uh, you've only been playing in, in Carnage, Carnage Esports, that name of the team. Has yeah. there been other teams, you know, that you've been also a part of that kind of has not been kind of talked about as much compared to that that to that team? Uh, for CSGO, that was kind of the main team that I was under. So we had a few different name changes, but that was the core roster that I played with under a few different names and with a few different player changes. Um, and then... When my time with that team ended, that's kind of when I started to... I looked at co-ed, um, and I didn't find a team that I felt fit at the time. Um, and then Valorant came out really soon after. So it was just kind of a perfect timing for me to make that transition. You know, I was already between teams, trying to figure out what I wanted to do next. Um, and yeah, Valorant came out, and it was perfect. Oh, yeah, for sure, for sure. And... I asked Bibion back in Dallas about how she viewed the state of Oceanic CS, and she's, I mean, I don't want, I don't want to, like, say actual quotes because I can't actually remember what she said, but I'm going to try to paraphrase it. But more so, she kind of said that the Oceanic scene is kind of dead, you know, due, due to yeah. the reasons that you said, you know, how there's little teams, little orgs, little competitions and stuff like that. Back then... Was that kind of how it was back then, or was it like much bigger? And in addition to that, did it kind of like decrease tremendously? You know, from the time you left up until now, you know, did that kind of did it kind of like devolve in that sense for you? Yeah, so I think there's definitely been ebbs and flows in the OCE scene. So when I was competing in CS:GO, I think it was on a bit of a downward trend. Um, because previous to, before I started competing, there was uh, a competition called oh, WPGI, and that was a female circuit. They would fly out for lands pretty frequently, um, and I think there was maybe eight teams or something that would compete in that, maybe more. Um, and when I started competing, there was much fewer teams, and then when I started to leave CSGO, I think maybe Viv's team was the only one left and that maybe be another one other team. And that's kind of been a bit of a trend recently. Like there'll be one one team in like the impact or game changes equivalent for Valorant in CS that kind of will stick it out and play co ed. And then there'll be other teams that will form for events but not necessarily be around year round because there aren't competitions to play year round unless you're playing the co ed events. Why do you think such a state exists for, for Oceanic CS? I think also one might say Oceanic Esports in general, because I mean, uh, w w w one of the big parts that I feel is the 
proximity and just the fact that basically you guys are isolated uh having to play in APAC and then having to deal with pretty 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 bad ping and then also trying to play in North America because we've seen that happen uh in the early years in in Valorant where oceanic teams would play in North American events a big example of that is 2021 North American LCQ in which the top two teams of the oceanic domestic um, competition would then progress to the LCQ and then they have to play um, an opening round which would then send them to like I think the double bracket elimination but then mm. that kind of didn't happen because I think visa issues and then I think there were still COVID regulations going on so ultimately they didn't even travel yeah. to North America and they didn't even compete which then led to just you know LCQ just eliminating them you know taking them out of the format and yeah a, a good I mean, this is kind of the state of oceanic esports. So, um, uh, do, do you kind? Of, what do you kind of think is the the big reason as to why oceanic CS slash esports is what it is right now? Yeah, I think um, it's really interesting that you brought up that um, NA LCQ that OCE was supposed to have a pathway for because I think that kind of started Valorant's downward trend. Um, so Valorant and OC, we had quite a few orgs at the start of the game getting into it. We had a fair bit of support um, and we had a lot of teams competing, a lot of like seasoned CSGO players, like top players were playing at that time at the start of the game. Um, and slowly players have just sort of started retiring as they realize there's not really any opportunity to path through OCE up into other other regions, other competitions. And yeah, I think that LCQ that you mentioned was a pretty big milestone for our region. Um, so I think it was Chiefs and Order, I believe, mm -hmm. maybe at the time, mm -hmm. that was supposed mm -hmm. to qualify through. Um, and I think what happened is Riot was supposed to kind of liaise with the Australian government because of the COVID restrictions. Australia was very, very strict on our COVID and border restrictions during that time. Um, and it just, it missed the deadline. Um, and OC was just kind of pushed aside a little bit. Um, I don't think we were really given any additional opportunity to make up for what our qualified teams had lost. Um, which made it really difficult, and it was very, I think, disheartening, especially for those players who had qualified. Um, because getting to prove yourself against like North American players, it's what everyone wants to do, it's what I've wanted to do. Um, and the pathways have kind of gotten more difficult since then. Um, and yeah, I think it's just the reasons why OCE has trouble. I think proximity, like you mentioned, um, we don't get very good ping to many other places. If we want to play in APAC qualifiers, you kind of have to fly four hours across to Perth and then you can maybe get 60, 70 ping to Singapore servers. Um, and then as well, population, I think, is a pretty big factor. So we're a pretty small region comparatively, so we can't really have that sort, same sort of um, self-sustaining ecosystem um, because we don't get the viewership numbers that, say, like China can sustain themselves individually because they've just got the numbers they've got viewership and because of the viewership they can get sponsorship and then that all kind of trickles down into like the organizations and the tournaments and just more money into the scene yeah and it does then lead to just situations like with you you know having to move and just having to go to a different a region and just uh, just to try to extend or start a, or pursue a career and it's been instances that we have seen so many times in those dexter and then uh bob people that you mm. mentioned stuff like that and yeah it, it just kind of led led to 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 situations like that it is what it is you know people are going to try to sometimes take look after themselves and just try to find a career elsewhere if there's no kind of opportunity in in the area that they're kind of living in so i mean by that sense it's very understandable for you know people to 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 go out of, of oceania and just 
getting to 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 a different environment and stuff like that yeah 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 and from that point on you then decided to start a valorant career and you mentioned a little bit about going into valorant but more so what made you want to decide just to start playing valorant and eventually then formulate a career uh, in that game yeah so i think um around the time i was between teams with csgo i still had that drive to compete i just didn't really know where and you know what that would look like but when valorant came out it seemed like a really great opportunity because it had like csgo mechanics and like fundamentals so i felt like that would give me you know a bit of a head start i wasn't starting again i was starting from you know the knowledge that i had gained from my time playing csgo um but then it also had that benefit where i didn't feel so much that i was playing catch up all the time so i think when you start playing csgo you're playing against people who have played maybe 1.6 or CS Source, and maybe they have 20 years of tactical FPS experience, and the game is very, very structured in how you should play and what's the correct way to play. Um, if you think of CSGO strats and utility, you know, you're throwing a smoke at 52 seconds while your teammate throws a flash at 51 seconds, and, you know, it's, it's very structured, you know, and there's not much flexibility and if you don't have a lot of experience and a lot of practice, it feels very difficult to catch up to other players who do. Um, which is why when Valorant came out, it's a lot more flexible. Um, there's a lot less structure, so it means that a, a lot of your um, ability to improve is going to be on how you can react as opposed to how you can prepare. Um, and because I was also getting it on the ground floor, I felt a lot more confident in getting better faster because I was at that same sort of base level as a lot of other players. Were you always playing the Sentinel role? You know, because you said that, that basically Sentinel's been your only role on a competitive front. You Did you play different roles, you know, when you were starting out, just to get a feel of the game? Um, I think when I started, I probably played Duelist. I probably played Jet and Phoenix like everyone else. Um, <laughs> and I think my first team, I did play Sentinel just because um, I did have that FPS experience and I think a lot of other people on the team didn't. And Sentinel requires a bit more independence, especially when you're lurking, you need to be more confident in your own decisions. Um, and so I kind of fell into that role pretty comfortably. Um, and I have played other roles to fill for teams that I've been on. So I've played a little bit of flashes, um, a little bit of smokes, but um, yeah, it's always kind of fallen back on Sentinel at the end of the day. Like, did, did it kind of did that role kind of gravitate you? You know, for, from the jump, you know, outside of just your um, your your starting days, you know, tr just trying to understand the game. Was that did it became apparent that you were always going to to play Sentinel and stuff like that? Uh I've never felt super locked into it. Uh it's just kind of been the role that I've fallen into and it's made a lot of sense for me to play that role but I've never felt so attached to it that I wouldn't pick up another role in future like I'd be happy to play smokes I'd be able to play pretty much any other supporting role I don't think I could ever go back to duelist um I just don't have the energy levels but uh outside of that like I've always enjoyed any supportive role and sentinel is just a great way to play that sort of style yeah, and according to to your VLR page, you've been able to to start it playing in twenty twenty two, and then you know uh, playing in events such as I think the OS Valorant Challengers League last year, and a little bit of in the APAC Open qualifiers, and then a little bit here and there, uh, of APAC in the second Open qualifier. And then, then that's when you decide to go to North America. Just talk to me about your experience in, in APAC, in competing in, in the domestic side, and just having to deal with different teams from different countries, and just having to, to to to, to, to just try to 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 stand out. Mm. Yeah, definitely the APAC experience I got. Um, I will disclaimer it with those teams were pug teams, so we didn't have any practice. We just 
picked it up, played for fun. Um, but it was really, really interesting. So we played on, I think, 110 ping to Singapore most of the time. Um, and so the play style we had to play was very, you know, swing or get swung, pick up judges, um, wide swing as many angles as you can because of the ping difference. Um, so it was interesting, but also the APAC teams um, just on their own level were really cool to play against, um, that sort of style. I know also when I was playing co-ed, we would try to get some scrims against the teams in Singapore on occasion. and. Yeah, it was definitely a different style, I think, to OC and to NA. Um, and yeah, it was always a very good experience. So I think the top OCE teams would try to get scrims from APAC um, because the practice was just better quality at the time. Uh, looking at APAC nowadays, this is sort of an echo of Paper Rex and just having them have good mechanics, be aggressive, work as a unit and then do everything just as a collective. And do you kind of get us, uh, was that kind of basically the sense of how you played against those APAC teams, you know, back in the early days, you know, before that kind of mantra then went to the forefront or was it kind of a little bit similar or different from that dynamic? Yeah, I think it has always been the style. So I think um, it's always been a looser way of playing, a bit less structured, but also, um the mechanics of the region have always been really strong and shined like i know paper x are probably like the best example of it but other teams have played like that historically as well um but yeah i think it's not just paper x it is other teams in the region that play that way and it's been like that for a while and i think oc is kind of the same like we don't have super structured way of playing especially in a smaller region it's harder to get that very strat heavy style um but yeah relying more on just like momentary plays i think yeah you mentioned a little bit about playing um teams from singapore was it like actually I, I'm, I'm gonna assume but was it actually like challengers you know level teams you know in, in those kinds of regions you know actual actual team like that um sorry can you repeat the question yeah um you mentioned a little bit about screaming against you know singapore teams were they like challenger level teams you know teams in challengers that kind of front uh i assume they wouldn't be so at the time i was probably um my co-ed team we were around top 16 in oce um and comparatively to apac that's uh probably not good enough to book a challenges scrim and um i'm not too sure what level of teams we would play against but um i'd imagine like middle immortal level teams um would be roughly what we'd play against and you know we'd get official experience against some of the top oce teams but yeah that's roughly where we're at each person has their own view or more, more so a person each player has like their own person that they kind of look after and just kind of serve much more closely compared to the others within the scene. Do you have someone like that for you? Um, for VODs that I watch, I think I started off watching a lot of Nats. Um, you know, the Sentinel role and how he played, especially like in Gambit, he was considered the best Sentinel at the time, and I think he's still very, very good. Um, more recently, I've been trying to watch Sigetsu. Um, again, very good, and really it's just, I look for players that play my role and stream so then I can get the POV perspective, um, but I think those two players are probably who I pay closest attention to. So just trying to be like a, a lurker, you know, just trying to play like Nats, you know, the, the, the rat king, <laughs> that kind of Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah, and trying to... Yeah, understand the lurk timings, trying to understand how they're playing off their utility. Um, even when I was watching Sugetsu, I was looking a lot at um, how he was peaking and taking fights. That's something that I really wanted to work on for a while. Um, and yeah, it was definitely a great help being able to watch their streams and try to mimic that myself in-game. Okay, for sure. And as someone that has been playing 
for a good while, you've been able to to play against a, a variety of of good teams. Um, which kind of team kind of stood out to you the most as an opponent? Um, more so in, in 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 Valorant, and also if you can share also a little bit in CS as well. Yeah, um, I guess CS:GO. I think we played in Katowice, so we definitely played against some Brazilian teams that were very good, and I think that's who might have knocked us out in the first round. Um, so those games were really cool to play. Um, and I think for Valorant in OCE, we played some officials against Fun Crew, and I think we might have played against Bonkers at the time, and they were um some of OCE's best players, best teams at the time, and, you know, we, we weren't good enough to play against them at all, but it's also just, like, it's interesting to know what it feels like to be kind of shut out of a match and be really, like, have that huge difference um, and kind of know how big the gap is between my team at the time and the top of OCE. Um, so I think that was really cool. <laughs> um, Maybe my teammates didn't, but I thought it was really cool. Um, and I guess since moving to NA, um, probably the biggest name that sticks out is we had our official against FlyQuest, and that was really interesting. So it was when the team had just formed, um, when FlyQuest had just formed. So I'd be really interested to see what it's like to play against them again, um, now that they have a few more reps and a bit more experience. but. Yeah, that was very, very cool. Um, and also, I've, I've always loved playing against Pande in GC. Hmm. I feel like her IGLing has always been very good and um, it's always been a very interesting match. And I don't know if I've won yet against her. So, yeah, that's another player that I enjoy playing against. Oh, yeah, for sure. Hopefully you're able to get that up in the future. Yep. <laughs> you know, hopefully with, with, your, with your new team. Uh, and yeah, yeah, interesting that you brought up FlyQuest Red, right? but on in a in the greater sense, you know, competing in unpaid dogs. You know, although you know, yes, the name is kind of funny to look at <laughs> uh, for for that team. It it does boast a, quite a, a good array of players. One of which includes Slandy, I believe, is your current teammate, right? Yeah, and then yeah. Edith. I think both of them were also a part of that Misfits Black twenty twenty two squad. Um, in that regard, you this you know, taking part in that team after playing a variety of other teams, you know, in the lead up to the start of the 2024 season. Um, how, how do you look back on that kind of experience in unpaid talks? You know, although, yes, you, you guys didn't qualify for a main event, but you guys did make a, a good showing, um, in the qualifying session, then take then facing fly Chris Red, as you said, and then also at a time taking them to overtime where it was also on the on the verge of, of potentially taking that map and then extending it to a map three. Yeah, yeah. So I really, really liked that roster. Um, like you mentioned, there was some experienced players. I think Carly might have also been a Misfits player or maybe had played with Edith and Slandy before, maybe on a different team. I'm not 100% sure. Um, but yeah, they all had very good experience along with Juna 4. She also had a lot of experience um and yeah we didn't have much time again to prepare with that team uh but i think we did have a pretty good showing especially at that first open qualifier i was pretty proud of the way we played and where we placed um and again at that second open qualifier i think we had a bad day um on that last day but otherwise we played well and yeah i think it was a really great kickstart to my um, like game changes Korea, like it was great that I was able to play with those players, and yeah. Going a little bit more closer into facing FlyQuest Red, you know, losing map one, but map two. I mean, what happened? I mean, you guys were on, <laughs> uh, uh, on the midst of that comeback and just trying to and just forcing overtime, but then you know, of course, as is usually the case, it ultimately amounted into a fake comeback, allowing FlyQuest yeah. to win it in overtime. You know, what happened in, in that in that match? Um, I don't remember too much of Split specifically, but I know overall in that series, a lot of the rounds felt like they were coming down to 
just maybe like mechanics or 1v1s or trading and yeah because it didn't feel like we had lost the game in um like our overall like macro of how we were playing and approaching the game it felt like our general approach was solid and fine um especially because at that point they didn't have um you know much time to like formulate strats and plans themselves um so i think we kind of were able to match them on that level and i think um flyquest has like some phenomenal aimers on the team like they're all very very sharp and so are we but i think on the day the, the trades and the the jewels just weren't going our way yeah and uh, i'm looking at the the scoreboard of that match you know looking at you you're scrolling down onto the bottom going with 1021 kd not a good showing but it, 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 it's a it's a good experience nonetheless and just taking it for, for the future and given the fact that we've been able to talk about various things within your career what do you feel has been the, the, the one thing that kind of changed the most for you from the start going back to to cs and now as you now sit here talking to me about your new team your new journey your new home uh in canada yeah um i guess like i definitely have a lot more confidence so when i started i didn't really know left from right i didn't really understand much about what went into becoming better at a tactical fps and how to improve um i very much had to rely on my teammates to kind of direct me and give me a lot of like insight into what i should be doing whereas now i feel like i've got a lot more understanding of like yep if i take these steps i will get better i will improve um and yeah i've got a lot more focus and direction with what i want to do and where i plan to go these days especially since moving yeah um what do you feel is is, is your your favorite moment in your career you know competitive career is it was it that one appearance in katavica that kind of set everything else underneath it or something like that yeah i do think kind of it's it does take the cake um especially i'm not sure if it shows but i got to play because we got knocked out so early in the tournament we got to play the show match um on the main main stage of iem katowice and yeah that was just incredible um i think i actually came pretty close to winning it i think it was like a 1v1 and i lost the 1v1 but yeah that show match was definitely um a cool memory for me and yeah it's very fun like actual show match like actually playing you know playing yeah playing yeah so it was the main stage of iem katowice before i don't know like astralis played their match we had a show match and um i think it was myself and three other teammates from australia and there was some local poland pros playing and i think i lost to the poland pros and there was a few other um people i'm not sure where they were from as well but it was um right when i forget what it was called but the csgo released that new game mode it was like a battle royale type um okay, okay, something yeah. yeah so it was right when that came out and they were kind of showcasing it or not or like using it as the show match and so we played that game mode um and yeah i came pretty close but didn't end up winning but it was really uh, really fun okay that's I, I I kind of interesting uh did you meet any like people in the kind of looked up to in that kind of um environment you know any players any casters talents uh, a little bit so i remember viv and i we had um because we'd played in the like impact version of the event um we had pro player passes like lanyards uh, which get us like backstage access and everything like that and viv and i before i think it was astralis's match we went backstage and they were like huddling during a timeout or something and we didn't want to like bother them or like disrupt them obviously but we just kind of we walked past them and then we walked straight back <laughs> and then you know viv was so excited she was like jumping up and down like oh my god astralis and like you know everything and i was excited as well obviously and like it was very fun like we didn't say hello we didn't wave we didn't do anything we just walked past came back 
Um, but that was yeah, a lot of fun. Oh, for sure, for sure. I, I, I was you know as a member of press, I, I do um walk over to the back of like the, the press area, and then that's where I meet some of the players to do my interviews. Of course, you know, yes, I'm a professional. I just gotta compose myself and do my work. But yeah, sometimes I kind of catch myself and say, "Oh, <laughs> what what the fuck am I doing here? Like, these are legendary players, you know, in CS." But yeah, I mean, I kind yeah. of understand that that kind of feeling that you had back then, and yeah, um. Uh, we're wrapping up with a few more questions before the end of it. Um, okay, now that I have someone has been playing in two games, the two I would say rivalry games <laughs> in the <laughs> FPS, which is better? Valorant, CS, one hundred percent. So easy. You know, I tried to play CS the other day, and I tried to hold an angle for one minute straight, just staring at one angle, and I couldn't do it. You know, Valorant that- just. More fun, e- more to do. <laughs> not even a moments of hesitation. You just said it right then and there. Okay, I yep. understand that. Uh, <laughs> I haven't looked back. Oh, for sure, for sure. Um, another thing. How would you compare your experience in Pro CS and Valorant? You know, how would you compare the two? Now that you've been having a few years under your belt at this point. Yeah, I think it's difficult because my CSGO career it was definitely like um, a honeymoon phase so even although I maybe um, wasn't as good of a CS player as I am now a Valorant player um, I got very lucky that I was at the right place and the right time um, to be able to qualify for these international events Um, so it's something I really look back on and I really um, have very fond memories of those events but I do feel like my experience with Valorant, I feel I've kind of earned everything a lot more and I feel a lot more confident in who I am as a player now that I'm a Valorant player. Um, and yeah, I feel like any progress that I'm making now is very like, there's no luck involved now. From now on, it's kind of what I've done to improve. Whereas CSGO, I kind of, yeah, just landed some lucky gigs maybe. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to how I progress myself this time around. Oh yeah, and now we're at a point looking at game changes where we don't just have people that have played that have already had experience in the FPS level. Now we have people that are that are basically starting their careers in Valorant and just having natural talent in this game, and it's it's a pretty different. Um, a rodeo to 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 face, you know, for you and also other other of your peers who came from the same kind of environment as you did. So yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. And now going back into your current state, um, starting with your new team in with KP, and then also the all those aforementioned people in Middle East, Landy, and Castler what are your expectations for this team now as you guys start getting your screaming done now you start competing in events as a official collective you know what are your expectations for this team for this year um i do think that it is a team that has a very high skill ceiling um has a lot of potential um i will try to be realistic like this next open qualifier that's coming up, we don't really have the the reps that we need maybe to show completely what that will look like and how good we can become. But um, yeah, I'm hoping like this qualifier will be round middle-ish. Well, I really want to qualify for main event, obviously, but um, yeah, I guess later in the year we'll have to show what the extra time um, will produce, I guess, yeah. And I guess like the the end goal, the main goal, may, make main event, but also who knows? I mean, I don't want to say it, but like still, make, <laughs> maybe make cha- champions. You know, GC champs. Yeah, yeah. So I guess my sort of end goals are always like GC champs, but also co-ed. Um, hmm. Making it through like the challenges quals is always something that I want to keep in the back of my mind and be ready to um, compete in. And I know, like, Katsumi has been playing co-ed a lot, and Bob has been playing co-ed a lot. 
Um, so I guess um, keeping stride with players like that, I want to make sure that I don't lose sight of the co-ed goals as well. Uh, and quick shout outs to Bob for actually making that happen, qualifying. Yeah, exactly. Their, with their team. And yeah, massive respect goes to her and her accomplishments, um, both in in CS, I don't think they played competing in CS, so maybe they did. I'm not sure, but uh, in a little, Valorant, but... <laughs> a little bit, yeah. Uh, yeah, shout outs to her and accomplishments in 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 those games. But also shout outs to you for doing the same, doing this interview, having given me the time to just talk about your career and your your growth as an individual. And yeah, thank you so much, Riv, for for this. Do you got any final words that you want to share? For anyone in the world? Um, not overly, but just thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, this has been really great. Um, and I appreciate your time.